So is graduate school key to your public service career? Can you afford it on a public interest salary? When should you go? Well, our next panelist cannot answer these questions specifically for you. They can provide some helpful tips and suggestions to help you think through the possibilities of graduate school with a public service career in mind. So I'm really delighted to introduce you to our three panelists. Profess uh, presenting first will be Dr. Atul Grover. In his role as Executive Vice President at the Association of American Medical Co Colleges, Dr. Grover provides strategic leadership in the areas of medical education, academic affairs, healthcare affairs, scientific affairs, learning and leadership programming, diversity and inclusion, public policy and communications. Um, at at AAM, AAMC, he previously held roles as Associate Director for the Center for Workforce Studies, Director of Government Relations and Healthcare Affairs, and Chief Public Policy Officer. Uh, previously, Dr. Grover held positions in healthcare finance and applied economics consulting, as well as in the U.S. Public Health Service, the Health Resources and Services Administration, and the National Center for Health Workforce Analysis. Uh, Dr. Grover received his medical degree from George Washington University School of Medicine and his uh, PhD in Health and Public Policy from Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Grover also holds faculty appointments at GW uh, University School of Medicine and Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Thank you so much for joining us today, Atul. Happy to be here. Um, thank you. Uh, then we're going to hear from Joan Ruttenberg, the director of the Heyman Fellowship Program and assistant director for government advising in the Bernard Cotin Office of Public Interest Advising, OPIA, at Harvard Law School. Uh, Ms. Ruttenberg graduated summa cum laude with Phi Beta Kappa recognition from the University of Illinois and cum laude from Harvard Law School. After graduation, she clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit in Baltimore, Maryland. Joan was a Bigelow Teaching Fellow and Lecturer in Law at the University of Chicago Law School. She practiced as an Assistant Attorney General in Massachusetts while also teaching law, political science, and healthcare economics at universities throughout the Boston area. For the past 16 years, Joan has directed a fellowship designed to encourage Harvard Law School students to begin careers in federal public service and advise thousands of students in public interest careers. Welcome to the panel, Joan. For, uh, for our scholars interested in diplomacy, Brianna Suarez currently serves as the International Admissions and Operations Manager at the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. In her position, she guides prospective students to find the right graduate school programs for their careers, works internally with member schools and works with outside partners and employers on hiring qualified candidates for positions across multiple sectors of international affairs and public policy. Originally from New York City, she completed her undergraduate degree in international affairs and French at the State University of New York in Pulse. She graduated with a Master's of Art in Security Policy Studies from the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University and specialized in conflict uh, resolution and intelligence during her time there. Uh, previous to her position at APSIAS, she also worked at Doctors Without Borders. So each presenter is going to provide remarks first, and then we're going to devote the rest of the time for your questions about graduate school. Uh, so please take it away, Dr. Grover. Great to be with all of you today, and uh, apologies that it's not in person. Uh, we're getting somewhat used to that, I think. Uh, so my name is Atul Grover. I am a Position by training, I've got a background in public policy as well, and um, my career has been, you know, somewhat serendipitous. I, I have had the opportunity to work in academic medicine and in um, in academia in general, as well as in a not-for-profit organization, like I work in now, uh, as well as the federal government. Uh, and for for-profit consulting, everything's a little different. And certainly, um, you know, what I do now is is a bit unique. And if you want to hit the next slide, Nora, um, this is just a bit about our membership, which includes all 155 now uh, MD granting schools in the U.S., 17 in Canada, about 400 major teaching hospitals and health systems, and then about uh, 80 professional societies that are. Uh, sort of like the academic groups of surgeons, academic psychiatrists, et cetera, as well as basic scientists. 
Um, and then we also have a, a 70 year relationship with the Veterans Affairs uh, Administration. Um, and many times the VAs are actually connected to uh, our institutions um, physically or virtually. Uh, and about a third of our faculty end up having some kind of appointment over there. Almost everybody who trains in medicine will have some experience in a VA medical center uh, and um, either through their, their med school period or residency period. Uh, and um, it's a, a great relationship. You know, these institutions, if you uh, hit the next slide for me, please, Nora, um, they do a lot of different stuff. They're big institutions. So if you think about, you know, where you guys are in Connecticut or, you know, you've got Yale New Haven Health, University of Connecticut, if you're down here in Maryland or BC, Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, out west at Stanford Healthcare or the University of California system. These are big institutions. And so our membership really is the medical school and the health system, as well as all the faculty and then the learners within. So they're doing a lot of different things. And, and our focus as a membership organization is really to advance the health of the public, primarily through medical education. But you know, our members, even though they're you know, 5% of the number of major health systems out there, they provide about 25% of all the clinical care. Um, moreover, they actually do um, about 75% you know, of all the training of health professionals. It's not just medicine, but across the professions. And they also do over half of the NIH funded extramural research. Um, they are anchor institutions uh, and hopefully serving a, a strong and vital role in the local economy uh, and embracing public health. And then uh, certainly um, they do cutting edge care. So if you look at things like level one trauma centers, transplant units, those are almost all entirely in these institutions. Um, if you hit the next slide for me, please, Nora, the, the face of medicine is changing slowly. Um, women have made great advances in terms of their representation within the student body of medical schools. They are uh, now a, a bare majority, but they're uh, about 50% over the last several years. Um, anyone that would uh, sort of talk to you off the record would probably tell you if we you know, weren't trying so hard to balance things out, we'd probably have even more women. Um, they're very strong candidates. Uh, However, there's still a lack of women in our leadership role. So if you look at the number of deans, it's probably less than 20%. Uh, and similarly, if you go down uh, and look at chairs of departments or full professors, uh, women are underrepresented. Um, so a lot of work to do there. It's even worse for people from uh, underrepresented backgrounds, women or men. Um, so while we've had some slight upticks in Native Americans, Blacks, African Americans, Hispanics, Latino, Latinos, Latinx uh, in medicine, um, it's been woefully slow. And in fact, we really have not made significant progress in the last 30 years or so. Uh, and so that's something that is really critical to us as we move forward. If you could hit the next slide, please, Nora. Um, the, uh, you know, there are lots of options for careers in medicine. And that's sort of one of the things that I would kind of leave you with is that uh, you really can do anything in just about any of these careers. And I certainly work with a dozen or so uh, lawyers at my association that do everything from, uh, you know, public health to regulatory policy to uh, more uh, traditional legal work for the association. Uh, we also happen to administer the MCAT exam. So for those of you who have to take that, I apologize particularly in this, um, this climate right now, it's been very difficult for, for everybody applying to school. Uh, we also uh, run the application services. So, you know, there's, th there's really just such a wide variety of things to do. And I'll tell you that as a child of immigrants that, you know, something that always struck us kind of growing up was that it's a nation of second, third, and fourth chances and second, third, and fourth careers. Uh, and so nothing is kind of forever. Um, but, you know, the key is really your own flexibility as a human being and as a professional. Um, so if you look at what kind of drives people to go into different careers in medicine, there's things like personality fit, how much they like the content of that specialty, if they like working with their hands and going into surgery, if they want long-term relationships versus short-term uh, income and work-life balance certainly has um, uh, an impact as does desire for staying in academia versus doing private practice. Um, but again, a lot of flexibility there. And even within every specialty, I'm a general internist, 
but you know, I've worked as a hospitalist, I've worked as a primary care doc, an urgent care doctor, worked in an ER, um, I've been a consultant, I've you know, sort of mixed all these things together by remaining flexible. Um, so Nora, if you can hit the next slide for me. Uh, there's also a lot of flexibility in terms of financing this very expensive education where people graduate if they have debt, uh, somewhere upwards of $180,000 in debt. Um, certainly there's a, a lucky small percentage that don't graduate with debt. And unfortunately, uh, medicine still draws from people in the highest uh, socioeconomic strata. Uh, and again, that's a place where we are working on our diversity, um, but it's very difficult, particularly if you think about people who are, um, you know, as, as a group, um, not making it through high school, through college, you know, K-12 uh, or K-16, uh, graduation rates for black men in most cities is lower than 50%. For K through 12, those that go to college, it's uh, only about 30% of those that start will actually finish with a, a bachelor's degree. Um, so uh, these are all kind of critical things, but what we know is that there's a lot of different ways to finance your education, military, veterans affairs, research-oriented careers. Um, they can either be through loan repayment or scholarships and also public service loan forgiveness. So if you hit the next slide, Nora, uh, the public service loan forgiveness is, you know, we've done a lot of analyses looking at um, your ability to pay back student loans that, you know, $200,000 in debt. If you're, um, you know, it's one thing if you're a neurosurgeon or a plastic surgeon uh, and making six, $700,000 a year. Um, but even general internists and family medicine docs and pediatricians are making more than, than 90% of the U.S. public, um, you know, generally at least $160,000 to $180,000 a year. And it is very, very feasible to pay back these loans uh, over the course of a couple of decades. Unfortunately, it's like a second mortgage or a third mortgage. Um, but there are options here. One of them that wasn't around when I did it was public service loan forgiveness which basically if you remain in uh, a government agency, a college, university, a 501c3 like I am, um, if you do that for 10 years, they will actually forgive the remainder of your loans. Uh, and because the uh, payment for these loans are often income-based right now, um, which again is a change in the last decade or so, um, this makes it a really, really appealing option for a lot of physicians uh, in particular because our careers begin in training uh, at teaching hospitals, which 95% of which are not-for-profit organizations and 501c3s most commonly. So next slide, please, Nora. Um, you know, there's the public health service as well. I happen to take advantage of this program as a National Health Service Corps scholar. Traditionally, these people go into uh, service for a couple of years for every year of loan repayment they get, they go work in the Indian Health Service or work in an inner city or rural area that has trouble attracting health professionals. Um, so all of these I really just include, so for your reference, so you can go look them up in these slides. The, the last slide, please, Nora. Um, and going to, uh, if you're interested in medicine or any health professions education, uh, go to AAMC.org slash first. And we've got loan calculators and such there, so you can actually see how this would play out. Um, so that's really what I wanted to tell you with my 10 minutes of just, you know, there's a lot of different options here. It's a great career. It's a lot of flexibility, no matter what you do. I'm sure my other um, colleagues here that are presenting will tell you that you know, most of us and, and the people that we know are really inclined to help um, people who are starting their careers or mid-career or even thinking about second or third careers. So reaching out to the people that um, you admire, that are acting with integrity, that are authentic leaders, um, you know, that, that may or may not happen to be in fields that you think you want to go into, um, you know, reach out to those people. They're very willing to help. And uh, all I would say is in turn, please help everybody that comes to you along the way. Um, one of the reasons that I'm always willing to do that is uh, sort of cosmic karma. I know that I will end up working for one of you that I'm speaking with today in some fashion or another. So uh, it's always just a great idea. So I will leave it there and look forward to the other panelists' uh, presentations and the question and answers. Thanks, Nora. Great, Joan, we'll turn it over to you. Great, um, thanks. And thanks very much, um, Dr. Grover. Uh, 
First thing I will say is, uh, uh, per one of his comments, um, some of the best and most interesting careers that I've ever seen have been serendipitous. So if I can give you one good piece of advice starting out, it's be open to serendipity. So, um, <clears throat> so you're in this program, presumably, because you're already interested in public service. And I understand you've already had some great introductory presentations on paths into public service. I also understand that many of you are considering graduate school, including law school. So what I hope to do today is talk a little bit first about what a public service career in law might actually look like, and then offer you a few factors that you might want to consider as you think about whether or not to go to law school and perhaps which law school you might like to attempt. Um, so first of all, what is public interest law? Uh, the first thing I want to say is that um, in law, you'll often hear the phrase public interest law, and you may wonder if that differs from the category public service. Um, while many use public service really to refer specifically to government work, in my office at least, we define public service very broadly, and we use the phrases public interest and public service interchangeably. So what does public interest law mean? Uh, as we define it, it is legal work whose primary goal is to benefit a large public interest. Uh, for example, environmental protection, the protection of civil and human rights, the furtherance of the rule of law, uh, would also include legal work that involves representing traditionally underrepresented individuals or groups, those in poverty, those facing criminal charges or already incarcerated, groups who have experienced a history of discrimination, um, and more generally legal work that seeks to improve the world in some way. So why would you pursue a career uh, in public interest law? Uh, we wouldn't necessarily do it for the pay alone, uh, because typically public interest lawyers do make a little bit less than those in the private sector, but you can make a living at it, and often a very comfortable one. Um, but public interest careers offer things well beyond the salary. So, uh, for example, a shared sense of purpose with your colleagues. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that uh, there's actually research that shows that liking your colleagues is very strongly correlated with work satisfaction among lawyers. Um, so it's not a throwaway factor. Um, finding meaning and importance in your work. In my office, we like to call this the psychic paycheck. Um, and having a, a, a generous psychic paycheck helps to avoid the alienation that some lawyers experience when they're working solely for the money or somehow trying to find sufficient satisfaction just in the craft of, of what they're doing. Um, public interest practice uh, includes the opportunity to work on challenging and in some situations cutting edge legal issues, uh, includes the satisfaction of helping people who need assistance. Um, uh, one interesting thing is that public interest law practice often affords way better training and experience uh, because of the early and significant res excuse me, responsibility that you get, um, then you'll get in private practice, especially if you want to get into court. Um, and finally, public interest practice uh, offers you the ability to pursue a particular passion that you may have for environmental protection, for civil rights, for criminal justice reform, for fighting public corruption, etc. So what does public interest law look like? Well, it is a huge, extremely diverse field, much like the medical field that um, the doctor was just describing. Um, but I'm gonna try to give you a short taxonomy to help you get your arms around it. Um, I would say the public interest law field is usually broken down along three dimensions. The first dimension that I would use would be the practice setting. So this is the type of legal employer that you'd be working for. Uh, public interest law practice can span a huge variety of settings, and these settings can include things like government, federal, state, local, all levels of government, um, the nonprofit world. And among nonprofits, I might divide them into two sort of subcategories. And the first would be law reform, impact litigation, and policy groups. So these organizations' missions would be to protect and defend the legal rights of groups or to bring about social change. Uh, these organizations tend to be organized either around particular issues like the National Resources Defense Council or the Human Rights Watch, or around particular constituencies like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the National Women's Law Center, or MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, and then second, client-oriented nonprofits. 
concentrate primarily on representing individuals. So for example, legal services or legal aid offices, which provide basic legal services to those who couldn't otherwise afford them and tend to be um, uh, scattered throughout um, all the entire country and, and localities. Um, so that's, that's uh, the nonprofit practice setting. Unions are another practice setting. If you're interested in um, labor law and workers' rights, unions uh, definitely use a lot of lawyers. Um, intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations, if you're interested in public international law. Uh, and then what we call private public interest firms, which are law firms, mm -hmm. but they devote some or all of their efforts to things like representing clients experiencing civil rights violations or employment discrimination, pushing for environmental enforcement or compensation, uh, assisting in the development of affordable housing, et cetera. Um, so that's practice setting. And you can see already that there's pretty enormous variety in practice setting. The second dimension of public interest practice, I would say, is the type of work. And this really refers to the day-to-day -day legal work that you engage in. The, the, when you get to the office in the morning, what do you sit down and do? What are your tasks? This can also run a huge gamut. So for example, you could be representing individual or institutional clients in court or in administrative proceedings. You could be researching and writing legal memoranda or briefs. You could be drafting legislation. You could be preparing testimony before a legislative body on behalf of a client. Uh, you could be advising a government employer or a nonprofit employer on how they can achieve their policy goals within the confines of law. Um, so you can, you can extrapolate from that that the kinds of things that you may be doing when you sit down at your desk, or maybe you won't even be sitting down at your desk very much, can vary quite a bit. Um, the third dimension of public interest practice, I would say, is the issue area that you work within. So this would refer to the substance of your work. And again, nearly limitless. Um, I sat down to write these comments, and I took about a minute and a half to just churn out a bunch of examples. And this is only the beginning. So let me give you a, just a, a litany of the subject areas that you can work in if you want to be a public interest lawyer. Uh, white collar crime and criminal fraud consumer protection, civil rights, education law, food and drug law, housing discrimination, criminal justice reform, international human rights, environmental protection, immigration law, employment law and workers' rights, reproductive rights, freedom of speech and religion, indigent criminal defense, voting rights and election law. <clears throat> That's 15 right there. If, if you wanted me to, I could add another 15 without breaking a sweat. So, let me shift gears a little bit here, but I'm going to connect this up and you'll see in a moment how I do that. So what makes a happy public interest lawyer? Um, and again, this is not a throwaway factor. Um, so job satisfaction as a public interest lawyer is usually tied to finding a good fit on all three of the dimensions that I just spoke about. Your practice setting, your type of work or daily tasks, and your substantive area of practice. And of these three, I would say, the type of work, the daily tasks, is particularly important because if you're not enjoying what you do when you get to work in the morning um, or when you move to your desktop and open your computer these days, if you're not enjoying those tasks, it doesn't matter what kind of work you're doing, who you're representing, how prestigious the job is, it's hard to find real satisfaction in your work and then it's hard to stick with it. So if you think you want to practice public interest law, um, ideally, you want to find a way to become a happy public interest lawyer. And if you want to become a happy public interest lawyer, in my opinion, it's extremely helpful to find a law school that offers some or all of the following. So to the extent that you do decide to go to law school and you're deciding where to apply and then perhaps have gotten some admissions and are deciding where to attend, these are some of the things that I would recommend that you think about. <clears throat> so the first factor would be a strong career office that can specifically advise you on public interest careers. Uh, it's a myth that public interest jobs are easier to get than private sector jobs in, in law. They're very competitive. And as you can guess from what I just described, it can be really challenging to navigate this very eclectic and broad world of public interest law. law. And so having a good advisor can really be a lifeline. Um, most law schools have at least one advisor who specializes in public interest careers, but some schools have many. 
And some even have whole offices dedicated to the unique role of public interest career advising, as does my law school. Um, strong support for public interest for a public interest career office also, to me, indicates a law school that puts its money where its mouth is. Um, at all law schools talk about public interest work and, and how important it is to them and to the world, um, but it's important to see uh, whether a law school is, is really serious about that and whether it's more than just rhetoric. <clears throat> the second factor that I would look for if I were a prospective law student is financial support for public interest summer internships and postgraduate public interest work. So um, as Dr. Grover mentioned, there are uh, opportunities out there um, like the Public Services uh, Loan Forgiveness Program um, uh, that can help you finance a career in public interest law. But there also can be resources from law schools themselves. Uh, law school is expensive. And a school that offers funding for summer public interest work uh, and or for a postgraduate loan repayment assistance program can make a public interest career financially feasible. Um, these programs vary a lot from law school to law school. There's not necessarily any consistency and the devil is often in the details. So it's really important not to make assumptions about these programs and about whether you would or you wouldn't qualify for them, but to drill down into the details with the student financial services offices at the law schools so that you can really intelligently compare what different law schools offer you. Um, some law schools also will offer generous scholarship money up front, sometimes tied to public interest uh, ambitions. Um, but, and that can be great, um, but make sure that you're not being penny wise and pound foolish. Um, going to a school that is stronger in public interest with a good loan repayment assistance program can sometimes be a better choice. <clears throat> I think you want to look for a law school also that has excellent clinical offerings. So figuring out which of these many, many opportunities will be a good fit for you across all these different dimensions <clears throat> can be really hard to do in the abstract. The best way to help you figure that out is for you to taste as many of the settings and work types and substantive areas that interest you as you possibly can. Then you've got some concrete data about what you do and you don't like. While summer internships are really important in this regard in law school, you'll only have two of those. And clinical courses can give you an additional hands-on experience that will both guide your choices and appeal to future employers. And I'm also gonna note here, um, you, you don't have to wait to law school to get these experiences. You can use the time between college and law school to be a paralegal, to work in a legal setting of, of some kind, to uh, network with lawyers, I strongly, strongly encourage you to take a year or two or three to work before going to law school. It will make you a better law school applicant, it will make you a better law student, and it will make you a better lawyer. Um, I think you also need to look for, in a law school, a community of public interest-minded peers. So the public interest job search is one where you have to be very proactive and diligent. It involves a lot of elbow grease and shoe leather, it's very different from the private sector legal job search, which in some ways can feel like stepping onto the beginning of a moving sidewalk and then falling off at the end into a law firm job. So since the majority of law students tend to choose this, in some ways, easier path into private practice, sometimes pursuing a public interest career can feel like you're swimming against the tide. So it's really important to have a support network of friends and classmates who share your values, who can help keep you connected to your true ideals and your ambitions. And by the way, these are the people who will be your professional network once you get into law practice as well. Um, a final note on public interest legal work. Um, it is not all or nothing. Uh, you can start your legal career in a public interest job and down the road, you can join a private sector law firm or an in-house counsel's office. You can start in a law firm, and after a few years, you can transition to government work or to the nonprofit world. You can work at a law firm your whole career, but be very deeply engaged with pro bono work throughout your career. You can move back and forth between private practice and public interest work. All of these are possible. Each one of these paths has its own pros and cons, and the choices that law students and lawyers make in this regard are extremely individual and can change over time, over the course of a career. So I wanna make one final plug for the great benefit of having access to 
really good one-on-one -on -one public interest career advising along the way if you can get it. Thank you so much, Joan. Um, Brianna? Uh, tough acts to follow, but uh, thank you all for having us here. Um, and thank you to my fellow panelists. I'm learning as much as our students are, our, the students are learning from you all, I am learning too. Uh, just a little background on myself again. My name is Brianna Suarez and I'm the International Admissions and Operations Manager at the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. And the association, which is the acronym is APSIA, it is a consortium of all of the leading graduate schools that specialize specifically in international affairs and public policy worldwide. Currently, we have 68 schools that are part of the members, uh, the, have membership with us. And so if you're interested in pursuing a career in international affairs or public policy, but want to do your degree outside of the United States, you can do so at an APSIA school. Um, and I'm gonna share my uh, screen to just give you a little, uh, a quick presentation on graduate school itself. And so I think I would start by the general question that this entire presentation is surrounding. So is graduate school key to a profession in public service? Uh, there is no right answer to that, honestly, because no, in, no one's path is the same path as everybody else. Uh, some students go straight into, grad, into their graduate school studies after their undergraduate studies. Some take a year off, some pursue a mid-career program. And so there is time, there is no right path, uh, but here are a couple of reasons why a student chooses to pursue graduate school. Um, there are changes in salary based on your graduate degree. So there was a study by the US Department of Labor in 2016 comparing those in certain positions with an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree. And on average, someone with a graduate degree is making at least $600 more a week. Uh, there is the ability to master a specific subject, hence the title of a master's degree. Uh, there's the career advancement. And this is really seen, especially for mid-career professionals who see that they can't get to the leadership positions without a specific certificate or with a master's degree. And there's the professional focus. You are really studying a specific topic, a little bit more niche than the undergraduate degree where you are taking a wide variety of courses. With a master's degree, you should be choosing something that is a little bit more tailored uh, to your interest and what your ultimate career path is. But again, there is no set path. A lot of students tend to want the answers of being told, yes, this is the thing you should be doing. No, you shouldn't head this path down this path. Ultimately, the decision comes to you, what your career path is, what you're interested in doing, and re-echoing what some of the pa our panelists have said, uh, thinking about what your day-to-day -day will be like once you do take your dream job. You know, if you aren't happy in that specific position, it's very hard then to continue at it and keep with it. And just the quick background on international affairs, it's such a large uh, topic, such a large field, and students tend to get confused and think that there is only one thing that you can do, that it is only working as a foreign service officer or doing diplomacy, when in fact international affairs really touches our lives every day and even when you're taking, you're drinking your cup of coffee. Um, international affairs, you can do a wide variety of things. You can focus on development and conflict resolution, energy in the environment, science and technology, uh, law, if you're not interested in practicing law specifically, but want to have some sort of connection to that, uh, education, space policy, which is a thing now. It really is about connecting your interests to, again, what you want your professional career to be. And so I'm going to go quickly a little bit about, you know, researching the graduate schools if you're interested in that, uh, how you should be doing that, a timeline and whatnot. Uh, as my panelists have said, it is very important that you do take some time off before you go to graduate school. That is not to say you can't go straight in, but taking at least a year off gives you the understanding of what you're actually interested in. Many students think they know what they want to do as soon as they graduate, but then take a job as let's say doing Peace Corps and then realize they're not really interested in international development. They're more interested in the emergency response aspect of it or are interested 
in working behind a desk. The year or extra time really allows you to explore and be more flexible with the things that you may think you're interested in and the things you realize you're not interested in at all. So when you're thinking about graduate school, you should be very open to a lot of the schools that are out there. There are many graduate schools, many specializations, many programs different in length, and students tend to gravitate towards the known names because they think that that is going to set them apart when in fact, maybe those programs aren't the right path for them. They may not be able to specialize in the thing that they're actually interested in. So I really urge students to cast a wide net as we would say, do your research, be open to programs that you've never really heard of uh, when you're researching these graduate schools. Um, and another key thing that I, I really want to stress, even before you're thinking about graduate school, is thinking about the financial situation. Uh, my final panelists have spoken about it previously, but I think this is one of the things you really have to focus on even before you start applying, is realizing graduate school, medical school, law schools, they're expensive. Um, you can't afford them, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the options for financing your higher ed education, but you should understand where you are financially at the time of application. You know, understanding where you are with loans, if you've taken loans out previously, if you're going to need to take out loans uh, for any of your graduate school studies, are you looking for a fellowship? Are you looking for a full ride to go to graduate school? Uh, these are very important and actually help guide you to look for financial aid options and scholarships that you wouldn't have previously looked at. There are many ways to pay for graduate school. A lot of it is doing the research, but again, you should have an understanding of where you are financially before application to see if you can afford it on your own or if you will be taking out loans or any of those things. And here are a couple of the questions that you should be asking yourself to find the right program, whether it is for international affairs, graduate school, law school, medical school, again, these are some of the things that should be circling your brain. And the first is what will you study? Looking at the academic structure of the program. Some students like a very rigid program where you, fill, you fulfill a certain criteria of classes and you get a degree in this, while certain students prefer something more flexible. COVID-19 has now led to many programs becoming hybrid programs and allowing students to take courses online and in person. Um, but that may not be the right path for everybody. So you want to understand what the academic structure is, how you best study, uh, and what, what degree you will be getting at the end of the program. The second is, are you qualified? And this is talking about the admissions criteria of the program. Every school publishes their average numbers of the admitted class, and you should use these as guideposts, not as set in stone numbers that without these numbers necessarily you won't get in, at least for international affairs graduate school programs. These are just a guide for you to understand where you would fall at application this year. And that gives you an idea of where, what you should be working on while you're applying. The third is, do you like being there? So the living environment, Again, you will probably be at a school for at least two years, and you wanna make sure that you are actually enjoying your time there. Uh, will you be paying for transportation to get to school? Will you have to drive? Um, if you're somebody that doesn't like to live in a city, I myself am a New Yorker, so I prefer to live in cities, then a school, for example, in College Station, Texas, was probably would probably have not been the right option for me. Again, the can you afford it? question, thinking about the financial situation. If you're going to be looking for financial aid and scholarships, that's probably the first thing you should be looking for as soon as you're thinking about graduate school. And then what's next? So this is more of the professional fit. Uh, and how does this fit into your uh, career goals? What degree are you getting afterwards? Many students, it's okay not to have an idea uh, when you're an undergrad. That's kind of the point you're starting to learn and you're being immersed in the professional field at this time look for the look at the alumni that you are interested in look at what they're doing with that degree uh, take someone out for coffee and ask them how they got into the position that they got into again there is no straight path into any career most of us have zigzagged our ways 
into whatever position we're at. Very few of the professionals I know, again, have a straight shot, straight path. So it's okay to question and want to know more. Uh, but again, look at the alumni of the program, see what they're doing with those actual, the degrees that they got so that you can get a better idea of where you would fall, whether you'd be working in a multilateral organization, an NGO in the private sector or public sector. And these are a couple of things, again, that you should be thinking about when you're applying. I won't last too much because on this slide, just because I really want to get to your questions specifically, um, but a application for graduate school will have a lot of components. So it's best to start early, even if you're not going to be applying to graduate school or law school or medical school anytime soon, the sooner you start thinking about what is part of the uh, application, the easier it is to prepare for it. Uh, and the less stress that you will take on when application season comes around. And again, this is a general view of what the application looks like. Uh, application form, application fee. Again, I won't spend too much time on these things, uh, but I do want to spend a little time on just what schools look for, because that's one of the big questions we often get, at least for international affairs, graduate school programs, uh, the first two things are an aptitude for study and a chance of success in the program. Again, that is why they're asking for your transcripts and things like that, because you're ultimately returning to school. So they want to know how you've done previously. Experiences and perspectives that will help others succeed. So many students tend to think that because they don't have an international affairs background that they can do international affairs as a graduate study or public policy, when in fact that may be to your advantage. Uh, schools are often looking for students that are coming from a different path, that are coming from a different background, that isn't the traditional IR uh, background, because you're giving someone else a different perspective on the same subject. It would be fairly uh, boring and not great practice if we're all thinking the same thing. So that's also another reason why we say for you to take at least a year off to explore alternative paths that you may not think were for you so that you get an understanding of the things you're actually interested in and the topics that you're gonna be discussing in graduate school. And again, a clear sense of professional direction. Where are you headed after graduate school? What is, it the, what is the career that you actually want and what will you be doing with the degree is extremely important for graduate school. And now fairly quickly um, on the funding options for graduate school. There are many ways to fund graduate school. Uh, at least from my experience, it is a lot of doing research. It's, it, and if you wait before, if you wait up until you've been admitted to graduate school, many of the fellowships and scholarships that you would have qualified for have already been allocated. So again, I keep coming back to this, but it's very important that you think about it before even the application. So. You can pay for graduate school uh, through the internal ways, meaning through the scholarships offered by the graduate school themselves, which are merit and need-based aid. Know the difference, those are different. Uh, research and teaching assistant positions, this is especially seen in the academia and PhD track. Uh, assistance provided by the Central University of Programs within the school and so forth. And then there are external sources of funding. There are grants and loans, know the difference, one you have to pay back, one you don't, and scholarships. And just to get you all thinking about how to do the research for scholarships, because that's also one of the big questions we get. There are many ways to do your research. Uh, you can do your research based on the specific career path that you're interested in. So for those, again, that are interested in public service, then maybe look at the scholarships that the Pickering, Wrangell, and Payne Fellowships give you. They provide full tuition to students for the two years that you're at graduate school at a specific graduate school and lead directly into work with the U.S. Uh, Department of State or with the U.S. Agency of International Development. But if that, those specific paths may be not the ones for you, then you can do research based on things you've done in the past. So for example, someone who is a returning Peace Corps volunteer can do research on the Coverdell's Fellows Program. Uh, you can do your research based on your citizenship. So, for example, OAS state member state uh, citizens have the OAS state scholarships based on nationality, based if you're underrepresented in a certain field, based on a specific topic. There are many ways to do the research. Again, there are so many fellowships and scholarships. There is no one database. 
because they're constantly changing. Funding schemes are constantly changing, but you want to do this research early on because you might be missing out on important on scholarships and money that you otherwise would have qualified for. And then lastly, uh, how do you become competitive for graduate school, even as an undergrad at this moment? Uh, these are the things that most of our schools are looking for, and not just our schools, but the employers that we talk to. Uh, these are the main skills that you should be building that will lead to a successful career, not just in international affairs, but I would argue in any uh, field that you're going into. So professional experience is extremely important. International is in parentheses because we realize that especially now not many students are traveling to take up internships or work outside of the united states but it is a possibility and professional experience can range from being a barista at starbucks to working the nine to five um, but it is important to have some professional experience hence why we say the one to one year off at least is extremely important writing well and speaking comfortably is extremely important as well uh, you should be able to write in different formats and speak to different audiences. It would be a shame if you had all of the expertise knowledge in, let's say, space policy, but were unable to communicate it to a different audiences or were unable to write more than the 40 page paper, uh, especially in the professional fields. In international affairs, you're most likely not writing 40 page papers. Most likely you'll be writing memos and briefs. Uh, so it's important to work on these skills early on understanding project management, how things come together, how projects come together from the moment of inception through execution, the cleanup is extremely important. And then building your network, understanding that even as undergrads, you have a network already inherently. Uh, the scholars here on this call are part of your network. Uh, the students that you take courses with are part of your network. The professors that you learn from are part of your network. And the alumni from your undergraduate institutions are part of your network. So you want to make sure you're building those because you really never know who will be the person to help you get the next position in your next job. Um, but with that, I know that was fairly quick, but I'm, I'm more eager to hear of the questions that you all have for us and how we can help you all uh, decipher really if graduate schools may be the right path for you moving forward. But thank you for uh, listening to me. Great, thank you so much. Our panelists really jam-packed a lot of really useful information. We have about seven minutes for questions. So um, if for the students, I'm just gonna ask that you ask your question quickly and if the speakers could um, keep their responses to about 30 seconds. Um, Bennett, would you like to kick off? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much all y'all for coming and speaking with us. Um, my question is to Dr. Grover um, about implementing public health education into medical school curricula, what that's you know starting to look like. I think there's been a big push for that lately. And so how are you guys at the AAMC handling all that? Yeah, thanks, Bennett. It's um, you know certainly a, one of the silver linings of the COVID pandemic is uh, the opportunities that are available. So certainly while we're on the front lines of taking care of patients who are critically ill, um, our folks are also thinking about how they partner with public health departments at the state and local level to think about contract, uh, contact tracing and surveillance. Um, the other thing you know, you'd ask about social determinants of health, back in 2015, we changed the MCAT to in include psychosocial behavioral elements, uh, including uh, social determinants. And um, so we've tried to make sure that that is something that everybody is thinking about at least before they come to med school and remember a lot of med school is experiential uh, and so one of the links that I, I shared with you all was what our teaching hospitals and health systems are doing and thinking about food access social support poverty reduction education strengthening transportation housing all these things affect health and so one of the biggest ways that we actually educate is to make sure that our students and learners are immersed in a system that's actually doing these things. So that, that's sort of the, the main things. And then we have a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control that we're actually kind of renegotiating right now in light of COVID to think about you know, how they want us to connect these. Great, thank you. Um, Wasik, would you mind asking your question next? Yeah, I got it. Um, so I wanted to ask Ms. Ruddenberg about uh, what's the best way for us to gauge our interest in um, what type of day-to-day -day work best fits for us? Try as many of them as you can. Um, you know, work in it. Certainly you should gauge your interest in writing. 
because that is the coin of the realm in law. Almost every career that you're going to find in law involves a lot of, sometimes a lot of research, but always a lot of writing and being an excellent writer is going to be really important. So you should definitely see whether you like to write and are good at it. Um, but just try, find ways to put yourself in different situations, have a couple of jobs in a row, do internships, you know, while you're still in college, um, you know, try a variety of settings where you're doing a variety of things, uh, you know, uh, um, shadow a lawyer um, who goes into court a lot, let's say a, a local prosecutor or public defender, um, and see if that feels appealing to you, or if, or if you look at that and say, oh my God, I would never want to do that. I mean, You'll have those reactions and try to be sort of open to them and aware of them. But the best way, to, the best way to gauge that is to try things. Um, Maria, hi. Um, I'd like to know more about the merits of an MA and/or a JD in the field of diplomacy. Um, I can start. I can start very quickly. Um, uh, so. There are a lot of people that do joint degrees, that do a, a JD, um, Masters in, in um, International Relations of Public Diplomacy. The Harvard Law School uh, for many years had a relationship, I think we still do, with the Fletcher School at Tufts. Um, so that's a very common and very sort of comfortable marriage in terms of degrees. I will say that a lot at a lot of law schools, you also could craft um, a curriculum that gets you a lot of the way there. They, you, if you go to a law school that has a lot of public international law opportunities, maybe even some clinical opportunities, you can craft your, your clinical and your internship experiences around uh, those kinds of experiences. Uh, most law schools will have a lot of opportunity to, do, to learn negotiation and mediation skills. So, um, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't say that, the, that a law degree would take the place of a master's in um, uh, diplomacy, but um, you definitely can get at least some of the way there. I would echo that. Um, there is a nat almost a natural marriage between IR and law because I don't know, the fields just are very interlocked in what you're studying and who you're representing. Um, and many programs offer an MAJD combo. Uh, the Fletcher School is notable for doing so. Penn State has a program specifically for law and international affairs. Uh, again, you can do that. It, the, what I would guide you to think about is what are the skills and that you're gaining from both of those degrees in the program. So if you're more interested in the law aspect of it, then maybe a JD is the right path for you. If you like to marry both, then maybe the combined degree is the right path. Uh, think about, again, the skills and ultimately what it is that you're going to be doing once you graduate. Graduate, For example, with many of the students that do a joint degree, they're working in international law at organizations uh, that are big organizations like Coca-Cola or things like that. And because they're able to understand the local context that they're working at because of the MA, aspect of the degree, but un have an understanding of the language that is law, they're able to take on those positions. So I really would stress you looking at, again, what it is that you're gaining from the program and the degree, uh, and what specific thing you're actually interested in within that program. And hopefully that answered the question. Um, I am a little bit conscious of time just because I know the students have calls with mentors, but we didn't really touch on a number of these questions. I was just wondering, would the panelists feel comfortable if we copied them and then asked them to, um, and then you got back to us um, at some point next week? Um, I, there, Nife, Nife had great questions, Veronica, um, and I, I would love it, you know, if we, if we could extend that opportunity, I would really appreciate it. I'd be, I'd be more than happy to, absolutely. And maybe give the students a little more opportunity to even think about questions that they might not have asked yet. Okay, so if you have questions on graduate school, please email Nora and we will try to get those um, collated in all the materials that are gonna be coming to the conference. But um, on behalf of the society, I just wanna thank our speakers um, for all the really invaluable um, tips and insider suggestions that they provided today. Um, I think we learned a lot of different things um, in terms of thinking about timing, 
um, and when and different resources that you can use in financing your education and really learning how you can match your individual experiences to a particular school. So thank you so much um, to Atul, Joan, and Brianna. We really are very appreciative of you taking the time to share your insights today. Welcome, good luck to everybody.